Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. Hi, and welcome to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. In today's episode, we're going to have uh, Ray Zadri, who is from a real insurance firm, a sort of traditional insurance brokerage. And he's going to talk about how he got into a relationship with a, a digital asset manager, what some people call a robo-advisor. And we're going to see um, Mona Zabit from the uh, digital asset manager in question uh, come on and sort of represent that relationship. I was really grateful for Mona for her ability to come on. I find sometimes with firms like this, there's a little bit of hesitation from the compliance side, but uh, her compliance department was really good. Um, they they gave the episode a listen and uh, we're happy with it. And here we go. So I do like that. I really appreciate the willingness um, for folks from investment firms to get out and uh, talk about their business model. Okay, uh, today's episode is good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. Um, if you're in Saskatchewan, where there's a cap on your number of investment credits, you got to watch that. But otherwise, it should be good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. It'll be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada, an IAS credit from Advocus, um, professional development credit from IROC, and client management techniques is the category for the MFDA credit. So we are getting those MFDA credits as discussed. Okay, the object for today is a, a fridge magnet. Um, when my wife and I travel together, we often pick up fridge magnets. Um, I don't think we've actually been to Zagreb together though. Uh, Zagreb, of course, the uh, capital of Croatia and this building where I've never been. I don't know why, I guess I must've bought this at the airport or something to prove that I've been there. Um, it's the Croatian National Theater. I had no idea, I had to Google it. Um, but anyways, there you go. Um, Zagreb, not a city that I would uh, necessarily go back to. I love Croatia, uh, but along the coast, it's great. So Split or um, Dubrovnik, where I've never actually been, but I've heard great things about, and I've been further north. I've always had a great time on the coast of Croatia. Uh, don't go to Zagreb for tourist stuff. All right. Um, I know you don't come for my tourist advice, and sorry if I've offended anybody from Zagreb. You can email me. So let's uh, roll into the interview then and hear about uh, Ray's journey to using a digital asset manager. Hi, I'm here today with Mona Zabit. Mona is the manager of customer success at Nest Wealth and with Ray Zadri. Ray is a manager here in Edmonton with uh, Faith Life Financial, a longtime insurance industry veteran. And Mona, you've been around the investment industry for a few years now as well, right? Can you just give us maybe a quick bio beyond that, each of you? We'll start with uh, Mona. Absolutely. So um, as Jason mentioned, Mona Zabit working in the customer success department at Nest Wealth. Uh, prior to Nest Wealth working at traditional investment shops, uh, you know, Fidelity Investments Canada or Nitix's investment managers, always partnering with financial advisors. Um, what's different recently is that now I'm in the fintech world. So still continuing to partner with advisors, but really looking to incorporate a digital aspect to their business as well. So really trying to transform the way they do business, but long time fan of working with advisors, just looking to do it a little bit differently now. And just before we hear your uh, bio here, Ray, can I, digital asset manager, is that maybe a preferred term here? Yeah, Nest digital wealth digital wealth provider, digital asset yeah. provider. Um, you know, sometimes you'll hear robo advisor, but I think as we'll discuss today, we'll see why we are not a fan of that yes, always. <laughs> I I have good reasons for it. Although I it's still my uh, hashtag of choice when I talk about them because it's <laughs> short. But uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, Ray, a little bio for yourself. Yeah, I I, I came I come from the engineering world. I used to be an instrumentation technologist. 
I used to write shutdown programs for boilers and then they go boom. Actually, I reverse engineered them so they could be safe enough to get an insurance policy. It was kind of weird because I wasn't in the insurance business yet, but yeah. now I understand that. So I kind of, I screwed up when my son got diagnosed with autism about all the mistakes I made that I didn't insure him. And I, because I didn't know. So nobody, it's nobody's fault. This is, I just wasn't informed. There's no way to find this stuff out. So after taking a leave of absence, I started doing this on a bit of a part-time basis and then I kicked it into full gear and went full time with it. And my, my thing is today is to make a difference for people. That's my number one priority. Uh, I, my role's changed. I'm now district manager of Western Canada for Faith Life Financial. So my role is to make a difference for their clients and also make a difference in their careers, which is something that excites me, is to build people's careers. Yeah, perfect. And of course, very education and sort of training focused, Ray, which uh, I think that, that keeps us always connected. So that's great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in your management role with an insurer, Ray, can you talk about then how you ended up working with, uh, with the digital wealth manager here? Yeah, it's it started uh, back in paper form <laughs> where there was no term robo advisor or nothing. I was introduced to a gentleman on the advocates. He's an advocate's a sponsor, big supporter here in Edmonton. And of course, we're both on that board as Jonathan Gold introduced me to uh, a different way to manage people's money on a really high level. And, uh, and, and I understand that. And, you know, I, I talked to even our guys, is I think insurance advisors aren't the ones to handle it because none of us have designations behind our name like Mona does to say that we actually really know how to do that. We need help. We need support to do it correctly. So when I got introduced to Jonathan, it was a great idea. So it's, we're going to talk about onboarding. We did everything paper. And, and Mona, this is why we never want to go back to paper. <laughs> it could take a month to onboard somebody. And, and it was great to have that portfolio manager to work with you and your clients and talk about the markets, things are going wrong. The, the only snag in the whole thing is there were minimums. And so basically, the, maybe the average person didn't have access to this where it would be a $100,000 minimum or a $250,000 minimum. If you want to get that kind of support at Manual Life, it's a million dollars minimum. So that takes a lot of people out of play. So when I was looking at somebody knew I was doing this and got a hold of me and then introduced me to Robo Advisor, which will explain why that's not a good terminology later. But and I started to do it and uh, with with different ones and then looking for the one that fit. I'm kind of like you, Jason. I'll try this, try this. Yep. One went total retail, didn't want advisors help anymore, which I thought was the wrong play at the time. And then I fell into another one. And uh, so basically, when I went to Faith Life Financial, Dwayne, uh, my, my, my vice president, I went to him and I said, there's a better way than do it than seg funds to do this. And I says, I want to introduce this to you. So I met with a team out there, our CEO and him, and I explained what what Robo Advisor was back at that time. And they really liked the concept. And Dwayne understood the downfalls of seg funds like you and I have talked. There's things about seg funds that really don't work. And he wanted to go down a different path. So they did a, a study about and some research about and had a team do it. What was going to be the best digital platform for us to do this with? So there were four or five companies that they interviewed and basically came back and he discussed with me about why they thought Nest Wealth was the best. And after he explained it to me, I did too, because I really didn't know a lot about Nest Wealth. It was the one I hadn't tried yet. Sorry, Mona. <laughs> you were there. You're just, at the, I only heard about you after I did all the other ones. But when it came down to support for clients, support major for advisors, because it does not exist at the other platforms. The support that's here, the things that they do, like even we talked a little bit before we started here about co-branding with come What they do is just incredible. Mona's fantastic. Her team's fantastic. And it makes a big difference because how is a, an insurance person going to learn how to do something in wealth if they don't have any support around? That's why most don't either do it well or they don't do it at all. So uh, any follow on comments there, Mona? I know there's a bunch of stuff there we are going to touch on, but anything immediately following Ray's comments? Yeah, no, absolutely. I love to hear that, you know, part of the reasons that Ray and the Faith Life Organization decided to partner up is because of the support. And I think that's incredibly important, not just because that's what my department focuses on, but because, you know, the message we give advisors is to say, there is so much value in what you do and the advice you bring to your clients, but you don't need to be an expert in investments. You don't need to be the one to do do the paperwork or the rebalance or anything like that. You provide so much more value elsewhere, but outsource that investments to us. We'll train you, we'll empower you, we'll educate you so that you feel comfortable introducing this to your clients. But we're the experts, we're your partners in this. So rely on us to give your clients that great experience. So I think we're so on the same page with that, what, what Ray mentioned. And I know um, sitting in the customer success role, uh, and carrying the CIM designation. I think that's a good example of how that sort of education support is important. Can you just chat a little bit about your carrying the CIM, Mona? 
Absolutely. So I, you know, don't come from a traditional finance background. I didn't study at a university, but when I started to work in the industry, I thought it was incredibly important to speak the language of the folks that I was helping out. And although I may not need the CIM designation to do my everyday job, it certainly helps because I'm just so much more in tune with what the advisors are doing day in and day out and the value that we provide and what we're ultimately trying to do in the in the end investor's life. So it really helps just be a little bit more in tune and connect more with not just the advisor, but the end investor as well. So I'm a big fan of education. <laughs> I always have been, and I don't think I'll ever stop. So that's kind of what drove me to get my CIM designation. I'm really happy that I did. A lot of sense. Now, Ray, you touched on account minimums already. And I know Jonathan Gold that you talked about here in Edmonton, sort of his his uh, selling feature, one of the features he had was that he had a pretty low account minimum relative to a lot of others. Yeah. You said like 500 or a million is not unusual. What's the uh, account minimum with uh, Nest? Mona, so do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah, I can take that one. So our investment minimums are $1,000. So you can open up an account if you need um, with below $1,000, just be mindful that it won't get invested until it hits $1,000. So we have folks who open an account, set up a monthly pack, right? Set up a $200 pack, knowing eventually they'll get to $1,000. Absolutely, that's no problem, but it's $1,000 if you wanna get your um, actual funds invested. So $1,000 really is our minimum. And Ray, you uh, sort of said, well, not maybe everybody needs seg funds. I don't wanna put words in your mouth here, but can you talk a little bit about how you decide whether, cause I know you still use some seg funds. So yep. how do you decide whether somebody's in a seg fund or whether you send them off to your uh, your digital partners here? Well, and, and actually it's really helping me with that is your spreadsheet that you and I went over about, you know, the seg fund guarantees and the, it's really guarantees are, of, you know, the bypassing probate. As the guarantees and stuff that we found out, they, they really don't work and there's charges to do that. It creates high MER. So that's where, you know, that's why I don't use them. But if somebody needs to bypass probate, it's, it's great because it's got the real, it's got a life insurance wrapper. So it really is a true beneficiary. It's going to do that. I have a case last year where I helped uh, uh, a client of Faith Life that didn't have an advisor, helped her son. She was passing away. So we put her, I think it was $400,000 into a SAG fund. And 30 days later, she passed away. Boom, no probate. Boom. They already had their money to them in a couple of weeks, wired to the States everywhere. And that's what made that so easy that we could do that. To me, that's the one role where it happens. So, but where, where it doesn't fit too is I think people's, Insurance people do that and I go, well, somebody 35, 45, 55 don't need that. This lady was in her late 70s. I got her, I got her safe fund in her late 70s because you can, there's no underwriting. So basically take advantage of the other stuff you can do and then move it over there later. And yeah, that one works out particularly well. And I, I obviously agree there's not like mathematically the guarantees just don't generally make no. sense on seg funds unless you're lucky enough to die in the first few months <laughs> after you invest there. Um, you can only, only somebody's yeah. wife would say that, uh, Jason. So, only yeah. I, was, I was lucky enough that he passed away. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but then the uh, so you're paying that you know that higher MER on seg funds. Now, the um, there's that sort of mathematical timing issue. But then something I do hear from advisors sometimes is this sort of behavioral pushback where people will say, well, you know, if I put the client into a product with a 100% guarantee then I know they're going to stay invested through sort of turbulent markets. And I won't push this one for you, Mona, because I think you might not be able to answer this for compliance reasons. But Ray, I'm wondering here if, you know, we did have a little dip in uh, March of 2020. Um, and did you see clients who, um, who were making poor decisions then um, where, you know, a seg fund might've prevented them from doing that, but, you know, they, they, let's say, could make that poor decision because they had direct access to their accounts or anything like that? I think the poor decisions not understanding the markets and sticking with the guarantee. And uh, of course, 100 percent is really hard to get nowadays and it's actually really expensive. Right. But I've always used an index chart and I was taught that a long time ago. And I just got a new one here this week where Faith Life is going to get some, too is that if you actually really educate your clients about how markets go down and how they come back and since 1934, it's really interesting in 1934, if you put $1,000 in the markets and didn't do another thing or a balanced portfolio to this time, you'd actually have almost a million dollars in growth. Yet through turbulent times, and what I like about the index chart, it shows the Korean War, it shows the Vietnam War, it shows currencies, it shows elections for both US and Canada. 
and all the, it shows SARS, it shows everything, and all these crazy things that happened in the plant. Two thousand eight was really bad, but yet it always came back and rebounded. And to go there, and it's a little bit educating too, Jason, because a lot of clients still they think they've lost money when it goes down. It's the wrong terminology. It's just down. You only lose it if you take it out, right? So I, I think some education would actually change people's mind about that. But you're correct. In the advisor world or any world, change is like a really, really tough thing, right? That's like gets like kryptonite. And I would love to add something to this because, you know, we witnessed in March 2020, there was a bit of dip and we kind of used this. We hadn't experienced anything like that, right? We hadn't been around in 2008. So we were wondering how will our clients react in these kind of down markets? And I think the benefit of Nest is that you have a team that you kind of consult with before you can take out your funds. So not only do you have your advisor, but when you reach out to us and you say, I'm going to liquidate my entire portfolio. We have a portfolio manager that reaches out and says, you know, may I ask what is the reason why I'm looking at your, the way you answered your risk profile question. It seems like you don't need the money yet. And just giving them that opportunity to let us know what their fears were. In most cases, we were actually able to take people off ledge, off the ledge, right? So we prevented them from making a mistake. And as we saw, the markets went up very well. So of course, for those who stay invested, they were very happy. And we found that the only situations where people actually took funds out was when it was a legitimate situation where they genuinely needed the funds. But we were able to save people from making so many poor decisions because they had a great team of not only the advisor to help them not make emotional decisions, but also our portfolio managers to give them the facts and really walk them off the ledge at the last minute. And Jason, I could add to that too. I think Demona, the value of having Nest wealth is I've had some clients email me over the bit too about, you know, what's wrong here? What's going on? What should I do to like this? I don't know the answers. I, I'm a certified financial planner, but I'm not a, I'm not a SIM. I don't know. So it was so cool to be able to connect them with a portfolio manager to talk it through so they could feel good and understand what was going on. And that's one of the, my biggest reasons why I did this is because I'm honest, I don't really know what's going on in the markets. All I ever knew is what a wholesaler told me. This is a great fund. That's what I always knew. <laughs> I don't know if he knew that either, Jason, but we'll, I'll, I'll ask him next time I have a, a, co a coffee with him. <laughs> um, so on that note of sort of communicating with clients, Mona, right? Th this is something that you would do both with your, and I'm going to, your business to business clients and your sort of business to consumer clients. So like I, and I'm going to say Ray here would be like B2B and I'm actually a, um, you know, a B2C client of Nest. So yeah, this is true for both sets of clients? Absolutely. So to give a little bit of background of how we have these different clients is at the inception of Nestwell six years ago, we decided to set up shop and really focus on the direct to consumer. Any person who wanted to have an investment account, we wanted to give them access to technology and low fees. Where we kind of pivoted a couple of years after that is because we had so many folks join the organization that had always worked with advisors. And they pointed out a main gap in our business model, which was that a lot of our clients were missing advice, really the power of advice. So we said, let's create a platform that allows us to give in investors hybrid advice. They have access to the technology. They have access to low cost ETF portfolios, but they can still get access to um, a financial advisor as well. So we do have some clients on our um, platform who came without an advisor, even though that's not um, an area that we market towards or our prospect towards, we of course did not kick those folks like yourself off of the platform, <laughs> but most of the clients we get now come with advisors. And at the end of the day, you know, we're a portfolio manager, we're a registrant, and we are legally obligated to treat every single client the same. And absolutely we do. So even if there's a client that joins our platform, finds our website and just joins without an advisor, we will treat them the same, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the questions I get sometimes when we talk about this is, you know, people who um, maybe haven't tried set up an account. And I always say, I don't care who you go to, but I think every advisor should go set up an account with one of the digital asset managers just to see like the difference between, and Ray, you talked about it, you know, how long it can take to get the paperwork done versus what is really a, seamless account opening process with the, you know, the digital asset managers. Um, so that idea of like setting up an account, it sometimes I think feels like there's two different compliance regimes, but that's not it, Mona. You have the same compliance regime as anybody else. Absolutely. Whether you're doing with paper and pen or you're using our digital onboarding tool, we're still bound by the same rules and the same regulations um, that we have. So think of it exactly as saying you're just doing it in a more efficient manner. Right. Any comments there, Ray? No, actually, I, what I believe is Nest Wealth helps the insurance advisors stay way more compliant. 
you know, we don't, they don't do uh, know your clients anymore. They don't, it, it's all done by Nest Wealth. You're, you're basically just a quarterback trying to help people onboard. Like onboarding seems simple. I have this little saying, like it's, it is simple if you know how to do it. It's like me fixing my car. I don't know how to do it, so I'm going to really screw it up. But if somebody taught me, I could do it. So I feel like the experience is that there's an advisor to help people through this. Also with different levels of technology now, because we're using Zoom so much to do this, but to have them prepared so it's a good experience versus a two-hour experience, which is frustrating, right? And if something goes wrong, and it has because it will, it's technology, the next day it'll get fixed because we just get a hold of Mona and team and they're fixed. But it, it is a great relationship that uh, I call myself the quarterback because you're the one corner because your clients are always going to get a hold of you first, but you're not going to answer them because compliance wise, Nest Wealth needs to answer all the financial questions. And as I understand it then, right, you you want to be there sort of when your client is setting up their account with Nest, right? Yeah. Yes. I have a great example with Jonathan and me. I, I would refer people to him at the time when we first started that he'd call him up and they wouldn't talk to him. So this is this is kind of where I learned this. And Jonathan's going, I don't know why. And and I didn't know why either. So I asked one. I said, hey, did Jonathan call you up? It said, uh, great. So well, you, you didn't connect with him. He says, well, because you weren't part of the process. If we're going to do this, I want you part of the process. So John and I, Jonathan years ago changed their the advisor had to become part of the process. And all of a sudden the referral thing just started to ramp like this instead of just sending people to do it on their own. Because we just, if you assume they can do it, you know what that's going to do for you a lot, <laughs> right? So I, I, I'm a, kind of a, the go-to guy with Nest Wealth at, at Faith Life. And uh, and then they come to me and it's more of a, it's just to teach them how to make their clients onboarding experience that good and feel good. Because once it's done, it's a piece of cake. It just flows after that, yeah. And Mona, can you elaborate a little bit more on, you know, when you get somebody from the insurance side, somebody like Ray who carries just, an insurance license, no investment license. What do those conversations look like? What do you talk about in terms of fees or landing page or you know, client onboarding? Yeah, absolutely. So insurance advisors are really the bread and butter of our business, right? These are the folks who want to focus on the things that they're good at and the things that add value, um, financial planning or helping navigate the insurance world for their clients. But of course, they want to build a fence around their clients, right? They want to also recognize that they might have some money that is suitable to go into an investment product, but they want to keep that within the same family. They don't need to refer that elsewhere. So we work with a ton of insurance um, advisors to say, you can outsource this to us, we'll be your investment partner, similar to how you would maybe go to someone for tax advice, or you can go to a lawyer, consider us your partners in investments. And what we do is we, you know, my team focuses on training the advisor, these are the kind of things we train them on how to use the dashboard, what the experience looks like for you, what the experience looks like for the client, we share um, a slew of marketing materials and FAQs to get them comfortable. You know, what we don't do is sit there and discuss the market on end or discuss the products on end or performance, right, these are the things that maybe, you know, you would focus on if you were an MFDA or an IROC advisor really the focus is on empowering them to use the tool and be, feel comfortable mentioning it to their clients. So the training I think that we give advisors um, is pretty comprehensive in terms of empowering them. And that's the focus. At the end of the day, if they feel confident and comfortable speaking to their clients about this, then we know we've actually done a good job onboarding them. That makes sense. How does that conversation differ if you're talking to somebody who's MFDA or, and I think you can do this for IROC too? So it doesn't, in fact, but I do want to add a dis disclaimer here. So <laughs> regulation dictates that we are not able to pay out referral fees um, to an individual who is licensed with an MFDA or IROC dealer. We do need to pay out our referral fees directly to that dealer. So we do have a couple instances where we have a direct relationship with an MFDA shop where their advisors are able to use our product and we will pay those referral fees out to them. In terms of how we treat them or onboard them, it's exactly the same. They are still relatively new to the technology if they haven't used a competitor before. So we need to teach them how to use the technology, how to have these conversations with clients and how it works exactly, what their role is and what our role is, because it's a bit of a new space. It's a unique space that not everyone is familiar with. That's perfect. Now, Ray, you get sort of a landing page. Like You have a personalized landing page for your clients. Can you talk about how that works a little bit? Yeah, I actually have it up here on my other screen. So it's co-branded with Faith Life Financial and, uh, and and Nest Wealth. So it's just it's a fax thing, and it's brilliant because you can uh, 
I have a couple of reps. They put under their name. They go for learn more about digital wealth. They got a link to this landing page. They can put it on Facebook, Instagram. But it just it's a real simple little summary about everything that Nest Wealth does from uh, CIPF uh, insurance on your accounts to the low how the low fees work, the referral fees, and and they break it out. That's one thing I, I like about this world is the fees are transparent, and they're and they're really really low. Uh, and of course, we. I, I'm going to be watching the Super Bowl this week, and I will be hearing some other competitors about fees for probably about four or five hours. <laughs> so I know that's yeah. big in the industry, the fee thing, right? But it's just fun to be co-branded with somebody. Like I said, I've been doing this for quite a while, from paper to digital wealth. I've never been able to co-brand with my name on it ever before, so it's really awesome. And, and the and the co-brand even goes farther because and I probably get this wrong. I think you own. Uh, Nest Wealth owns Razor Plan. Is that right, Mona? Did I get that way right? Right. So Razor Plan is free to all our financial representatives, and it's co co branded with us too. Like the reporting says, it's from Faith Life Financial, Raise Adri. Uh, you go into your admin portal with uh, Nest Wealth, their top right corner, there's a click button to go to Razor Plan. So you can do a financial needs analysis with your client. It's the same thing. There's a lot of electronic link. My guy's got an for more about digital wealth. This is for, uh, for a financial checkup. Click here. So these are all how we incorporate Nest Wealth as our partner, and that's 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 exciting for us because it, it, instead of having a whole bunch of people out there doing it for us, it's better to have one partner on the wealth side to do everything with us. And and we're big fans of partners, just like with the you know, business career college, Jason. We're partners with you guys too about education because we believe in what you're doing. And I've always think a partner is the best person to have on side with them. That's Nest brings more than just the portal; they bring a lot more. That's great, Ray. Any uh, follow-on comments there, Mona? Yeah, I know. I love the plug with Razor Plan because it really just highlights the the ecosystem we're trying to build for advisors. And that was part of the reason why we acquired Razor Plan is because we say, well, what we want to do is give you more time to do things like financial planning. And, and we're like, well, why not also give them the tool to do that? And we love Razor Plan. It's an extremely nimble tool to use. And we find it's really um, impactful in terms of the reports that are generated for the clients. So any new advisor that joins Nest Wealth, what we give them is the opportunity to get access both the Nest and to raise our plan to say, we're very committed to your, you know, to your business. And we think that having this ecosystem available to you is really important. So we're excited in the future. We want to do more integration with Razor Plan and Nest Wealth. So stay tuned um, for those updates. That sounds exciting. Um, and uh, Ray mentioned fees here. And can you give us a breakdown of fees, Mona? Yeah, absolutely. So there are three fees that you need to be aware of if you want to get a total cost to the end investor. The first one is, of course, our Nest Wealth management fee. This is the fee for us to open the accounts, to manage the accounts for you, and that's 35 basis points. So that's the annual fee for Nest Wealth. In addition to that, there's the portfolio MER. So this is the cost of the actual investments that you're buying. This is an embedded fee. And for our passive portfolios, it's approximately 13 basis points. We do also have active portfolios, and it is uh, 50 basis points. That's the portfolio MER. And finally, in addition to that, you do pay a fee to your advisor for the services that they provide, and that is a maximum of 1%. So that's the highest that we allow an advisor to charge. Um, and of course, that fee is collected monthly and paid out to the advisor as long as the assets are on the platform. So if you're looking at our passive portfolios, let's say you're looking at an overall at the highest end, of course, fee of one48 of course, it could be a little bit lower if your advisor referral fee is lower, but at the very highest end, it's 1.48 and you're getting both, you know, access to ETF portfolios and advice. One final thing I do want to say about fees is, of course, in addition to the 35 basis points, unlike many of our competitors, we do actually cap our management fees. So, you know, a, a little secret that everyone in the industry knows that they don't really like to admit is that at a certain threshold, it costs us the same amount of money to manage a portfolio. So we just we found out that threshold is around five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So if you have a client with five hundred twenty thousand or five million, really doesn't cost us any more to manage that account. So what we do is we cap the fees. When you hit five hundred twenty thousand, you'll be paying the same fees regardless of if your assets grow. And I love that because the thing that surprised me when I joined Nest was just how many large accounts we have. You don't think you're going to have multi-million dollar accounts on a digital wealth platform, but in fact, we do. And I think that's the reason why we cap our fees and people see the immense cost savings. So they really like to use that platform for it. Um, I don't think I knew you had active uh, platform on at all. How does somebody, so 
do you find most people, I don't know, Ray, if you want to talk about this, but do you find most of your clients go with a passive or index route? Or do you find most people want to go the active route? Or is there, uh, I don't know where that distinction comes in. Before I uh, pass it out to Ray, I will mention that, you know, adding active portfolios is a, it's a kind of a recent addition to the okay. Nestle platform. So when we first started, it was, it was mostly about low cost passive portfolios. But um, what we did is partnered with uh, four strong asset managers, a great, um, a great shop that we sub advise our passive or sorry, our active portfolios to. So we brought on four strong to give the clients the ability to choose active ETF portfolios. So still low cost, but of course there's that active component to it as well. It's something that we're going to be rolling out. Um, I would say to all of our clients, we of course did a limited rollout at first to, um, to advisors, but we're hoping to have it across the platform soon. And Ray, I think for faith life, most of the focus really has been on these uh, on our passive portfolios. It has, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I I missed that completely, Mona. So that's good uh, <laughs> good thing for me to learn. Um, and I won't honestly. Uh, I log in probably twice a year, so even when it goes live, there's a slim chance that I'll ever see it. So yeah. Well, you're the ideal client, Jason. If you're not logging in every day, it probably means you're doing well because you're not going to make emotional decisions. I know the whole bar of people, some analogy here, right? So, yeah. If, if you want to go insane, check it every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You will be jumping off a ledge because this is that. Just, just check it once in a while, too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's it. Convenience is not always our friend here. So, yeah. Um, now, can you talk, Mona, about? who owns the relationship and, and how this works. I know this is sort of a big question and I know this is something you have to be very careful about. So take us through this, uh, who owns the relationship? Absolutely, and I appreciate you asking that question because we get this question from advisors, we get this question from clients and we wanna be super, super clear that it is Nest Wealth who owns the investment relationship. So the investor is a client of Nest Wealth and we are a portfolio, a discretionary portfolio manager and a registrant. So all of the suitability requirements, the you know um, investing needs, everything like that lies directly with Nest Wealth. We have the fiduciary duty to the client. So it's really important for advisors to understand that when they refer one of their clients to us, they really need to allow us to do our job, meaning determine suitability, asset allocation, getting their funds um, invested and having those conversations with their clients. That being said, we're always happy to include advisors in that conversation. So in the communications we send out to the clients, we CC the advisor so they're aware, they know what's going on. But ultimately, every decision has to be made between the end investor and Nest Wealth, meaning the end investor needs to give us the green light to invest their funds. It can't be something that the we take from the discretion of the advisor. So you know, oftentimes people come in and say, well, what's my role? What can I do? What can't I do? Um, and we always like to let them know what those things are. And it's really never a problem. It's just kind of a learning curve in the beginning to know that what's on side and what's off side. But just to be super clear, it is Nuts Wealth who does ultimately own that client relationship. And you even use the F word there, fiduciary, Bona, right? And yes. anyway, all right. So she used it the right way too, Jason. And, <laughs> and this is something I think is worth pointing out that you have a statutory fiduciary duty to your clients as a portfolio manager. That's a that's a pretty clear thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks. That's, I'm glad you highlighted that. Um, Ray, can you talk about then how you manage the financial planning relationship when you have the sort of investment chunk, let's say, carved out or dealt with by this third party. So, well, it's, and it's funny you say fiduciary responsibility because we actually have one too that a lot of people forget from when they write their LLQPs <laughs> is that we're not supposed to go out and find the way to get the best returns. We're supposed to find the one that, down, down, you know, when the downturn comes, where do all the risk is taken away. And I think without a portfolio manager, you're not going to be able to do that, especially you know, like what we have here, we have a conservative pool, balance pool, uh, growth pool, that everybody in that pool, and most people end up in balance, we'll use that for an example. So my son's in there with a $4,000 TFSA, some guys in there with $25 million, they rebalance, everybody changed at the same time. And I think that's where my fiduciary responsibility and advisor is very important because I, I, I was explaining to an, a, a, somebody about onboarding, well, what would be different? Well, say, what if I had 250 clients, and I had to change everybody in the month of like, last March, right? She goes, What's my odds of getting that done in 30 days? She goes, none, because it's going to be a piece of paper. I got to do this. So the rebalancing thing isn't happening enough for people out there. Uh, so I think that's that's the important part. And and so from, you know, a financial analysis, I think when we're looking at people's statements and stuff is uh, 
is the fees, how they're working. You know, I, I had an example about fees. So I had a, an example of a SIG fund that I was helping somebody. They showed me their statement, did an analysis. It's not my client because I work with other people's clients nowadays, but MER was 2.86. Uh, the returns were way below where the TSX was since 2014. And because, but nobody's ever given them advice on this their entire life since they opened it up because it's a small account. And that's just kind of the problem in the industry is I don't, I don't believe any account's too small because I, I take on people's kids because why? Because one day they're going to have jobs and who knows what they're going to be doing someday. So my largest clients as a broker came from a kid doing $50 a month when they were in school going to college. So through that analysis like that, we can find out what's not working right, what's well. And especially using Razor, you don't have to worry about updating CPP, OAS, you know, inflate. it's all done for you automatically. That's why I... And I think being a professional, you should do that instead of using an Excel. A lot of guys still use Excel spreadsheets. You got to wonder, did they make an error? <laughs> if, if they actually given you, no one's better at Excel spreadsheets more than uh, Jason, trust me. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's an Excel god by far. But that part of it is so important and to incorporate them with Nest Wealth. And then, you know, their estate planning. And I think, it, I think the other thing, too, is... Uh, that we bring to the table is we bring a lot of free benefits because I was joke about this, but the one thing that most people don't have enough of in the country is a will, right? And why is that? Is the reason is really simple because they got to pay for it. <laughs> they want to pay for it. So if if you're a, if you're a client with Faith Life, you get a free one. So that also builds into now we got Nest Wealth, we got the Razor Plan, and the whole thing really encompasses itself. You know the financial pyramid we talk about. I, 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 and we felt without Nest Wealth that without that partnership, we weren't completing the financial pyramid because we didn't have a really good wealth solution. And a lot of it was the rebalancing, the fees, all that stuff like that. Like I, I go on Morningstar, I look all this stuff up and I help people through the whole thing. But I think that's what we bring to the table with the whole thing. I, I hope that answer is kind of a long answer, but. I, I think that's helpful from a perspective um, position, Ray. Now, Mona, can you talk a little bit about how Nest does ongoing client servicing? So you've got the account set up and. You know, I've been there for two, three, four years. What am I going to hear from Nest and, and how's the advisor involved in that? Yeah, so really when you're going to hear from Nest or anytime there's any updates to your account, meaning we've made any changes to fees or there's anything that's pertinent for you to know, or if there's any kind of regulatory updates, you'll certainly hear from us once a year when we need to do our annual reviews to see if there's been any changes to your life circumstances. That would mean that you need to change the answers to your risk tolerance questionnaire. And in turn, we need to change what your portfolio looks like. So at a minimum, you will hear from us annually, um, but then you'll also hear more so the important changes to the platform. You don't hear from us, I would say, we really do try to be respectful of the advisors and we don't wanna be bombarding their clients with too many updates. We're not gonna be sending them you know, articles and things like that just because we know that they are also in touch with their advisor. So we really try to minimize the amount that we reach out to the clients, the things that they're absolutely important important for them to know that is required kind of by the regulators for them to know or anything that would be actually impactful or, or, or helpful for them. Um, but we do try to um, reach out to our advisors a lot, right? We do have quarterly newsletters that we send out or quarterly webinars or training webinars and things like that to empower the advisor to have these conversations with their clients as well. Of course, as long as it's compliant, right? The things we focus on is not go to your clients and speak about asset allocation or performance. It's go to your clients and speak about, you know, how they can better use the technology or the tools to get the information that they need. So, you know, lots of training available for the advisors and for the clients. Of course, we keep them up to date, but without bombarding them. That's great. Thanks. Um, any comments back to that, Ray? Yeah, the, the newsletters, the webinars, uh, we get, like one of the best things we get to find out what guys drop their uh, MFDA licenses. We had a guy that was a guest of ours in a webinar we are doing for Faith Life yesterday. That all these people that we can access, but I, I and to tell you the truth, this is the first digital platform I've been on where actually that's been available. There's no update emails to there. There is to there is to the client, but to the advisor, there's nothing unless it's, unless the client's getting sent something. You do with Nest Wealth, there's just tons of information always coming out, and it's a really really awesome. You know, to uh, YTFSA, you guys have great calculators too. So yeah, it, they're awesome in how they do that, and they they really keep everybody in the loop. So just to be clear here, lots of communication to the advisor. Mm -hmm. only the yeah. sort of bare minimum to the client and anything that's sent to the client gets sent to the advisor as well. Am I yeah. summarizing that correctly? 
Yeah, generally we do like to give the, you know, an advisor a heads up to say, even just for our annual reviews, right? This is something that we do every single year and we're required to do. We'll just give them a heads up to say, we're gonna send this email because we know the first thing that's gonna happen when they get the emails and they have a question, it's going straight to the advisor. So we wanna make sure we give them a heads up. That being said, we wanna be clear, right? We have to perform this action and we will absolutely be sending out these emails. You can't opt your clients out of these in any way, but it's just to give them a courtesy heads up that this is coming and to say, um, you know, be aware of it. If you have any questions, let us know. Let's kind of partner together to get this done. Perfect. Yeah, this. I, my dad was an insurance agent back in the eighties and he always tells this story about, um, you know, when he asked his manager the first time what you do when there's a down market, his manager said, well, just don't answer the phone for six months. <laughs> so. I think I remember him saying, he taught, he taught me my LQP more yeah. so uh, yeah. I, I've never seen a better guy, Bob, to show the history of insurance since it started. It's like, it's an amazing story. I just, I enjoyed every second of it. Yeah. I think I remember him saying that though. Yeah. Don't answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. I tells that story all the time. It, it's a good story. So, yeah. yeah. Um, now, what about from a compliance perspective. So if I'm an insurance agent, I'm not carrying any investment licenses. Is there anything that I should be aware of as far as uh, compliance risks or concerns? And I don't know, Ray, is there anything you've talked with uh, Dwayne about here or anything that comes from head office? Biggest of all is don't give any advice on the markets, financial advice that way, because first of all, we're not qualified to do it. And second of all, like we can't read the other portfolio man manager's mind why they did it. And we can find out why they did it. So I think that's really, really important as you, you just, you're, you're, you're the quarterback, maybe the coach kind of thing, but you really need to make sure that you're not the one giving the advice on you should be in a balance, a conservative or, or growth that, that really has to come from a PM. Do you find that when, cause you're there for that onboarding yeah. process, so do you find that clients have questions there where there's sort of a temptation to give an answer? Oh, de definitely. There's all, even in insurance, <laughs> they always tempt you with it. So you, you, you just have to uh, not say anything, just explain to them, like, as we're going through the onboarding process. And you know, it's, it's really cool, Jason, too. I mean, one thing that on the onboarding experience they do, you can see your portfolio changing as you answer the questions. So I hadn't quite seen that before. So they can actually see what's happening in the background for them is changing. And I said, this is the professional advice that you get. So I've taught our guys to actually use that graph because it's pretty cool. Okay. Um, any other comments to that, Mona? No, I like that. You know, it is, of course, um, can be sometimes challenging because if a client is directly in front of you and they're asking you a direct question, you don't want to seem evasive, but really it's just, you know, going with that partner aspect to say that's a great question and we have an amazing investment partner who's happy to answer those questions for you and what we try to do is arm the advisors with good marketing materials that are client friendly they've been approved by our compliance department they answer things like what are what is going in their portfolios and what the process is so hopefully they can utilize those pieces which are approved by our compliance department and they're good to be used with your clients so that hopefully those answer a majority of the questions. And as Ray mentioned, it's really transparent what the clients are going into as they're onboarding. You know, we have the little donut as we call it, which breaks down the different asset classes that they're going into, the percentage of each one. And at the end, when you answer your 11 response questions, you'll have a complete breakdown of exactly which asset class you're going into and the percentage of each. So it's really nice. It's super transparent and hopefully answers those questions. Which on your yeah. portal too, Jason, it's really great because you can actually click down into what, I don't know if you've ever done it, but you can actually start breaking down what you're actually in, right? Which is so different than a seg fund because you, all you ever see is the top 10 holdings, right? Right. So you don't actually really see what's inside of there here. You can really drill down and you can find out if you really want to know, somebody will actually tell you. And usually with a seg fund, you're looking at the top 10 holdings three or six months ago too. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's changed a lot since then. That, uh, that, that expertise is so valuable. Like, like I've always joked about this is not to downplay anybody, but you know, like carrier that I use most of the safe funds with, I used to get the partner, get to meet a portfolio manager at a lunch and learn. And he said, hi, my name is da da da, and I'll see you next year. I got to get on a plane and go. <laughs> <laughs> and I always joked about that because after I met Jonathan, I went, wow, this is really powerful coaching and advice for clients that we're missing the boat on. I mean, it was just right over my head that that was available to us. And I, I think something else it, that's, kind of funny about it too and even on abacus for the longest time is this isn't really new that the, the portal's new and the, what Nestwell's doing new but the, these other companies have been around for a long long time like ETFs are not new to the industry and all the things they've done before uh it's just the education of where they're around and I, I want it's my job 
interesting story about, you know, abacus is it's always about taking care of the consumer, which is extremely important and taking care of us, but consumer first and insurance. Great. So I was, my role was to bring in speakers like Jason knows. So that I always bring the best practice guy. And so I discussed with him after about the wealth one. And I says, I don't think abacus has the consumer's heart or you know, protection at the best. Why we're talking about all the funds. We're talking about all the agents. We're talking about all this, but it says, what about all those people out there that are orphans that don't have an advisor? No one's managing anything. It's just lock, just roll the dice and let it roll. It's pretty common knowledge that if you have an account at a bank and you don't have a million dollars, you're never going to get a call. So we're really helping the consumers help do something with their wealth. And these people need help probably more than anybody else because this is their retirement. This is everything. You know, I've never worried about a multi-multi. I've never worried about LeBron James' retirement. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing all, He's doing good. But th that consumer out there and you know what he says we actually never thought about that and uh about there's a different way to do it because they kind of were anti-robo for a long time when i was on the board i was the only robo guy put my hand in the air everybody's as dumb as dumb and it wasn't because anybody didn't like it it's just they didn't understand it it's just a just a lack of understanding what it really does i'm surprised is, to hear a, a a celtics fan make a lakers reference but other than that i'm with you right so i had to <laughs> <laughs> It hurt, it, it hurt, Jason. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, 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 I'll pay for my sins tonight. <laughs> um, Good point, though. <laughs> any other comments there, Mona? Yeah, I mean, what Ray touched on is something that's very common in our industry, which is that there's a ton of misconceptions. Um, I think some of the misconceptions we get is brought on by the industry itself, right? We get advisors yep. that say, well, you're my competition. You're trying to steal my clients from me. Not necessarily. I know you're a little bit peeved by the four quest trade commercials you saw today, and it may look like we're coming <laughs> after your clients, but that's certainly not the case, right? We really want to partner with advisors so they can do what they do best. But we also recognize that, you know, look at the disruptive transformational companies like Uber, or Amazon, why is it that we don't treat our the financial world with the same kind of lens to say that it needs to be transformed and it needs to be more accessible? You know, the higher ups of my company might not agree, but I think that not every single person is a, you know, would benefit from using Nest Wealth, but it's pretty darn close. I think most people would benefit from using Nest Wealth because they get access to wealth, they get access to these accounts. And, you know, if you're not someone who needs a very niche, if you're not LeBron James, or if you don't need to bypass probate, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be using this wealth. I think it benefits a majority of people. And it gives also the average person access to wealth, right? My family, when we first came to Canada so long ago, we perceived investments or having access to the stuff as only for high net worth clients or the very wealthy. That's just simply not the case anymore. And we want most Canadians to know that they can get, get both financial advice, but also access to investments. So I think that's what I love about what Nest is doing. Um, it's, it's treating everyone the same, right? Whether you have 50,000 or 5 million, there's really no reason why you shouldn't get the same access and efficiencies. But that's, I don't, I just can concur, but Mona, I tell people that, that you're actually getting that now too. You're going to get, you get what the wealthy get, right? I always tell people, wealthy people aren't in seg funds. <laughs> they're not using seg funds. Matter of fact, they're probably paying lower fees than a lot of people, but this is, you're in, you're in, you're in where wealthy people are now getting their money managed. So you're getting that extra performance to do that. Unfortunately, Jason, I think one of the things we did to ourselves and me too, because I, I'm just as guilty as the next person. When I heard the name robo advisor, I thought they were getting rid of the advisor because that's what everybody talked about. And it was so far from the truth. It was just a bad name that seemed to represent that machines were taking over everything. And this, this is this could not work without machines. Like I, I like when Jonathan, Jonathan, and I even tried a little bit of robo and pull me out. It didn't work. You, you need the people in there to make it happen. That's very important. Yeah, I think the point there, and you brought both you brought this up earlier. That sort of word robo is kind of misleading here. I think that the you know, the digital aspect of it is is mostly administrative, and the sort of asset management stuff. So you still have an asset manager behind this. You're you know maybe running algorithms, but that's the like the the client relationship stuff is still all there so i, I don't know if you want to follow because i know one of you had a, a beef with that for robo earlier i don't know if you want to follow up there at all <laughs> wait see we both do <laughs> yeah. no i think it's and what we try to do when we onboard new advisors or introduce the platform is i love to introduce our portfolio manager team or support team to say nothing happens without human beings right we do have an algorithm and we employ con you know the concept of modern modern portfolio theory theory to create our algorithms to create smarter portfolios 
but that's about it, right? And we give you a digital tool, but if you want to open an account, a human being is helping you do that because they're speaking to the custodian and speaking to the end investor. Any trade that's done, any rebalancing, this is done by a human being. So we always like to say, meet the team. They're certainly not robots. These are the folks that are taking care of your financial health. But in the background, we're using a lot of smart technology and smart software and building on that so that we can do things faster and more efficiently and ultimately lower the cost for um, investment. So I love to introduce our team and say, these are the human beings that are, you know, your partners. And I think uh, people like that, right? They like to know that there's human, they say, well, who's managing my money? Who is taking care of my money in my retirement? Is it a robot? I don't understand. So we really like to humanize um, this digital wealth aspect as well. And, and another thing I, probably, I think most people don't realize, and probably Mona might elaborate on it a little bit better, but uh, like a lot of times when you're moving money around, so, you know, different portfolio managers you're, and you're not in the digital wealth world, there actually is a lot of other fees. There is funny, there's fees to close your account, could be three to $500. There's fees to you know, move something around. Those fees don't exist in digital wealth. They've really eliminated those fees. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, right, Mona? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. People ask, well, what if I want to pull my money out? You know, is there a fee to do that? Um, and things like that. And uh, no, it's really nice because you get to set up either a withdrawals or contributions and no fees to you. But I would be remiss to say that, you know, we do still have, um, you know, custodians who we partner with and who do manage the funds and they have fees, uh, certain fees, like if you want to do a, a wire transfer or one of those kind of things that are not in your everyday, those might incur a fee. But in terms of adding money to your account or taking money out, there's no additional fees. It's all covered in your management fee that you have. And just account types here. So you obviously have RSP, uh, RIF, LIF, Lira, uh, non-reg TFSA. What have I missed it? You have any group products, group RSP? So aside from that, you know, we have all of the registered and non-registered, obviously a notable exception. Uh, we have corporate accounts and interest for accounts as well. Um, the main one we do not, not have are RDSPs. Right. So, and that is, of course, you know, a limitation of the custodian that we have. It's not an account type that they can open. And you've probably heard me say a million times, you know, that we're about digitizing wealth and giving that client an efficient experience. Um, if we were to offer our DSPs, it would be done completely manually. So really <laughs> against the vision that we have and the services that we want to offer the client. So it is a big gap in, you know, our service offering, but it is the only account type that we currently don't offer. Yeah, that being the RDSP said, has a million moving parts to it, and I, I get why it's just not tenable, but yeah. I know you and I both have one, so we know the, the pain of opening one. <laughs> yeah, and sorry, Mona, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. No, yeah. absolutely. And no, I appreciate uh, kind of the business reasons why maybe some custodians don't offer it, and it's certainly something that I understand, but um, it is something that we hear often. It is a bit of a gap in the industry because not a lot of our competitors either um, have access to this account type. Um, maybe that will change in the future. Again, as we create better efficiencies where we could take a more complicated account type like an RDSP, but do it more efficiently. So from a business perspective, they say, okay, now this is something we can include, but that's, again, we just got to work towards that. But you did ask about group um, or a group RSP yep. platform and we do, it's actually a different line of business. It's called Nest Wealth at Work. And what we do is offer small to medium businesses a group solution. So if you are working with a business and they're looking to add something, you know, and they're maybe turned off by the cost or the solutions that they have previously were very expensive or very cumbersome, we do offer a solution that's very nimble and at zero cost to the actual employer. So no cost for them to implement it, um, very nimble kind of digital along the same lines of, you know, our other platforms, which is transparent and easy to use. So Nestle Health at Work, it is a separate kind of agreement and setup. But again, a lot of um, advisors do use it to add to their kind of ecosystem. So Nestle Health at Work or Nestle Health Plus, the investment side, and raise your plan to get that full package of offering. Yeah, yeah as uh, I have a couple of financial representatives that are going to be used. It, we kind of do a one-off if people want to do group RSPs. But it kind of goes back again to like they both don't know what they're doing, but somebody at Nest Wealth is holding their hand to help them process the whole thing. The other side is a lot of people don't realize that when you're in a group RSP plan, uh, you're actually you're actually the manager for your own funds. I have a I have a, a, a pension plan. I get emails of do, do, if you want to change something, here's how you change it. There's no one to talk to. <laughs> so you're getting that again, that high level wealth experience in this kind of a group plan that just doesn't exist in the group RSP plans at all with anybody. 
Yeah, that's that's really good. That's a good summary, I think, of uh, sort of the relationship that you've built here between uh, Ray and Mona. Any parting words for us? I'll give you the chance first here, Mona. Anything that we should have asked that we didn't talk about or any follow on comments? Yeah, I just really encourage anyone who has questions or is curious about the platform to reach out to us. Um, as we said, there are a ton of misconceptions about what can be done on the platform and who this is for. And what I hope we've been able to highlight today is that this is actually appropriate for a majority of investors and also many advisors who really want to kind of take back time to focus on the things that are adding value to the client's lives um, and want to still be able to offer investments to their clients or reach out to us. We're always happy to have a conversation and we're always happy to give referrals as well. Speak to the folks who are using the platform. You know, as Ray mentioned yesterday, we had a longtime user come and speak to the Faith Life team talk about his experience using the platform. So we're all about building that community as well. So happy to chat with anyone who's interested and really tackle those misconceptions and really just get rid of that robo advisor term, hopefully forever. <laughs> Ray, any uh, last words from yourself? Yeah, I'd like just to say some some advantages. Uh, like I, I think we, I probably, I wrote this down, I didn't bring it up, but one of the advantages is that uh, uh, clients can actually tr tr uh, deposit money to their own bank accounts themselves instead of getting a hold of me to fill out a piece of paper and initiate the whole thing. And they can change their addresses themselves. They can have redemptions themselves because there's an email that goes around. So that's incredible service. I, I, think, I think it's amazing that you can do that. And the other thing I think for, for advisors is uh, like, there's no KYC. You don't have, I, actually it's kind of funny. You don't, you don't even have a file on your client on wealth management anymore because you're not really allowed to have one. So the time saver on that, and of course the, the big of it, and then uh, higher residual income because of the way it's kind of funny, the fees really go down for clients, like extremely low, yet you're going to get a higher residual come as an advisor. And uh, I, my clients don't mind that at all. And I, I think you're just, your future proofing your, the, your future. And because my last comment is a change is a common, <laughs> right? I, I'm on your edge. ETF set a record last year. That's what all basically, that's wealth is ETS with companies like Vanguard, Forest Strong. She's mentioned some, some really strong companies that do that. They're, they've record sales last year. They're expecting record sales in 2022. It just keeps going like this. So it's not going away. So the problem with some advisors, they turn a blind eye. They, maybe if I just don't look at it, it'll disappear. It's not going to disappear. And then I talked about these four quick points about yesterday from Advocates, because you know me, big fan of Advocates and what they do. But here, what they're doing is just four quick things is uh, if you want to be a financial advisor or financial planner in Ontario going forward this year, you're going to have to have a designation or you can't say that anymore. Right. So that's a change coming. The uh, self-regulatory organization SRO, and I knew this was coming because it's just pandemic, as they announced that they're going to put MFDA and IROC together, there's a change coming. And it's in the last report I got, it's leaning towards this kind of a platform, that this is the platform of the future. And it, it's really interesting why they're talking about it. They're talking about it from the client perspective, like you said, the consumer now, they're not talking about it from the advisor perspective. I don't think anybody took my advice in that meeting I told you, but it's just by chance. <laughs> I'm just a little advocate guy, Jason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah, the other one is is these fees and these things we talk about. CRM3 to save funds is coming this year, which means the transparency that I told you I love, and I'm looking at them again at the, at the fees that it's there on, on, on our landing page. The fees are all broke down. Everybody can see exactly what's going on. Those large fees and those guarantees and the cost of them are going to become transparent on people's statements. And that's going to be something people are going to have to explain. And a lot of people are in that world because they don't want to do CRM too, so they go to SEGS. But in this world, it doesn't exist. It's not there. So an advisor, it just really helps you out. And the last thing is I hate sales charges. Low, deferred, whatever. I think they're crazy. Why are we doing that? We're supposed to be helping the client. When I, when I met Jonathan Gold, one thing I learned in the portfolio manager world that he was in and Mona's in and everybody else is in, that doesn't exist. It's an MER and there's nothing else you can do about it. And that's the way it should be if it's about the consumer. And finally, on June 1st, 2022, they're banning deferred charges in Canada. So whether people like it or not, change is coming. If you don't embrace it, it's going to kick you in the butt. Just like Amazon did the shopping. Same thing Mona was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's great. I appreciate both of you taking the time here. And uh, Mona, I know it's always uh, it's tough to do this kind of thing in a you know, tight compliance environment. So we, we get to see some good answers. I appreciate that. And Ray, really good of you to uh, sort of peel back some layers on the relationship. Everybody, thanks so much for your uh, time and your expertise and have a wonderful day. Okay, the number for today's episode is six. The number for today's episode is six. Now, 
Ray asked me a question about seg funds. We had a comment about seg funds in there about the guarantees and how the guarantees are not necessarily that useful. And um, I did a little bit of a, I don't know, a breakdown. This is something I would expect to hear, although a much, much lighter version. This is not, I know, the quality of research that I would expect to see on Rational Reminder, but it's the kind of thing I would expect to hear on the Rational Reminder podcast. Here we go. So in... Uh, must have been April of 2019, I had this question about the extent to which seg fund guarantees are worth it. Okay? And I have a whole bunch of data here. This spreadsheet has uh, 498 rows of data. It's quite long. Uh, we go over to columns well into AF. Column AF is the last full column here. Um, and what I did is I took the rolling 10 year returns for the TSX. So I pulled TSX index and I said, okay, at that return. So if you got exactly the return that the TSX gave you over a 10 year period, would a seg fund um, ever pay out? And whether we use a 100% guarantee or a 75% guarantee on a 10 year investment, there's no period over that 40 years over which a seg fund this is uh, 359, so really 30 years of um, end data, 359 periods. And there's no period there during which if you matched market returns that a seg fund would have paid at either 100% or a 75% guarantee. And if you underperform, then 100% guarantee seg funds do start to pay out. So the way that 100% guarantee works is if you sacrifice something, you take a lower return, well, then the guarantee is more likely to pay. So if you had underperformed the market by 2%, then about 10% of the time, a 100% guarantee seg fund would pay out. Okay, fine. Um, what about a five-year? So on a five-year basis, so if you, and I know there's no five-year guarantees available, I did this to sort of approximate dying in the first little while after buy your seg fund. So then, if you get exactly market returns on a five-year span, a 100% guarantee would pay out 11.5% of the time. A 75% guarantee would still never pay out. Now, if you underperform the market by 2%, then a 100% guarantee will pay out more than a third of the times, 37.23%. Uh, a 75% guarantee will still not pay out. And then, um, I do have some uh, six month data here. And over six months, you do see more often where the seg fund will pay out. Um, that's a little trickier. And I have to break down some of those numbers a little bit further to get something consumable. Um, anyways, the point is that in any sort of time horizon out into years and decades, that a 75% guarantee or 100% guarantee in a seg fund is really not all that useful against market returns. Now, I'm not to say there's no reason to buy seg funds. I still think they can be useful for creditor protection. Not a huge fan of confidentiality provisions. Uh, bypassing probate could be handy depending what province you're in. So not to say nobody should own seg funds. I own some seg funds, but I just think that sometimes the guarantees are oversold. Now, I'd love to see some data around what Mona gave us um, anecdotally in the interview. I asked her that question about whether or not people stayed invested as sort of a contrast to the story with seg funds that people stay invested because of the guarantees. I don't think people understand the guarantees will stay invested personally, but what do I know? Um, I'd love to see some data. So I don't know if somebody on the insurance side wants to bring me data that demonstrates that seg fund investors are more likely to stay invested through a downturn. I'd love to see it. Um, the uh, Now, maybe the DSC thing shows up there. I don't know. Anyways. Um, why don't you join me again in uh, two weeks' time? In two weeks, we're going back to a group benefits topic, so that'll be good for ANS credits. Uh, Dave Patriarch from Canadian Group Insurance Brokers is going to join us and look at their new product that really approaches risk in a way that I think is very friendly for small businesses. Thanks very much, and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits, and you'll have access to our full library of content.